Hi everyone and a massive, massive welcome to this British Science Week 2023 live lesson. We have an amazing seabed safari for you today. We'll be working with some fantastic scientists and they will be telling us all about the amazing life on the seabed. We'll meet them in just a minute, but a little bit of housekeeping just before we start. Hoping you've all got the video running. If there's any issues, do contact technical support. And that is via the green sort of chat icon at the bottom right of each page of the Encounter EDU website. Now we're hoping for lots and lots of questions from you. We'll be answering those towards the end. And so do put those into the chat app and that's on the side of your screen. If there is a question that is close to what you want answered, do think about clicking on the thumbs up button just to the side and that will upvote that question. We tend to answer the most popular questions first. Now, I know that a lot of you will be in classrooms, you'll be watching on the screen at the front. So if a teacher wants to grab a second device like a smartphone or tablet, then you can do all the interaction on that and keep the video full screen at the front. But without further ado, let's meet our fab, fab scientists, Adam and Kerry, who are coming to us from their lab in Exeter. Hi guys, how are you? Hello. We are well, thank you. You're well, brilliant. You've got an amazing seabed safari for us lined up. We and do. we're going to do some amazing things. We're going to talk about, I think we're going to talk about the seabed first and how big it is. And we've got a little poll for classes. We're going to look at some footage. And I know you've got an amazing friend, Paul, who's been diving around uh, the sea next to where you are, finding lots of great creatures in their natural habitat. And then you've got some little creatures that you've you've brought into the lab. So we can have a closer look and talk about the adaptations. Yes, and they're getting very excited in the tag next to us right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very excited, little seabed creatures. Absolutely amazing. So let's start off. Um, we've got this first section of this live lesson all about the size of the seabed. You know, how how big is it, you know, around the UK? And we've got a poll. We can get that poll uh, fired up, and that's going to appear in the chat up next to you, chat app next to you. Um, but I want you as classes to think about how big is the UK seabed? Now, you've got three choices. Adam and Kerry, I don't know whether you know the answer to this, but is the seabed half the size of the land? Is the UK seabed about the same size as the land, if you think on a, on a map? Or is the UK seabed nearly four times the size of the land. And what we're going to do is we're going to give you about a minute in your classes, see if you can come up with the right answer. And Adam and Kerry will have a little chat between us, make sure we can work out the right answer too. We'll see you back in about a minute's time.
it looks like we have some amazing marine science scientists in the classes watching so many of you getting the right answer so let's have a look at those sizes a big round of applause i think was that coming from you kerry absolutely brilliant so we've got this first little circle and this green circle represents the size of the uk land and as you can see on the slide it's about 250,000 square kilometers now if we add to that on the next slide we add to that the inshore waters now the inshore waters are those bits around the coast technically it's 12 nautical miles which are nautical miles just over uh, an ordinary mile a statue mile but that's the area going around the coast so that adds another sort of two-thirds of area to the uk and then if we add all the seabed which britain and the uk has control over um and that's for things like mining some of it for fishing some of it for putting wind turbines that nearly gets up to sort of i think if i'm right the total area is sort of five times bigger than just the single single land mass but yeah we're getting to four times as much seabed as land technically 3.65 now if we think about the fact that, that the uk has lots of dependencies and territories we can even expand that to the uk being able to look after hopefully uh nearly 28 times the size of the land in terms of the seabed so thinking about the uk seabed is absolutely huge and adam and kerry i think we've got a couple of maps that, that, that show this we've got a map um of the british isles and we're going to show that sort of pinky area around it that's the territorial waters and then that red line showing an area that's what's called an exclusive economic zone which is basically saying the seabed near countries is split up between different countries there's some different colors blues on that map too jamie which show the different depths of those okay. waters. so you can see we've, we've got some shallow sea but we've also got some really deep bits of sea within that zone as well ah. And, and so I think we've got sort of down to about 200 metres with the palest blue and then going down by about 1,000, 2,000 as, 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 as steps of thousands as that, that go down. We, we can talk about that more um, later in the lesson. So do you think that most people understand sort of how, how big the, the, the seabed is or for, for, as marine scientists, what, what, how does that make you feel knowing that there's sort of nearly four times as much seabed for the UK as land? Well, because most of that seabed is quite muddy, Jamie, I think it gets ignored a lot. People like to think of the rocky shores or sort of reef structures because that's sometimes where you see the biggest fish. But most of our ocean, the global ocean, as well as our UK seabed, is mud. But there's some really important processes that happen in that mud. It's probably one of the biggest carbon stores on the planet, far more important than, say, the Amazon rainforest, the rocking carbon. And so it's a really important habitat. And there are some very cool animals that live inside it. Maybe not as exciting as some of the big fish, but they do really important jobs. So I personally love a bit of benthic mud. A bit, bit of mud. So we've got um, a muddy seabed. And I think if you've ever stood by the shore, you can sort of like in some estuary areas, you can see that mud extending from the shoreline. And, and that goes all the way down to the deep. It does, yes. Um, obviously, people mainly when they go to the, the intertidal zone where the tide goes in and out want to go rock pooling because that's where you can find lots of cool animals really easily. But even in those estuary mud flats, when the tide goes out, it looks like it's just mud. There's lots of animals living in that mud. So we've got the muddy seabed. You've just mentioned the rocky seabed. Uh, and for those of us who like a, 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 a sort of going to the beach, we also have a sandy seabed as well, don't we? Yeah, we have uh, the sandy seabed. Um, sand's a really interesting one because the waves can push it around a little more. So the animals that live in the sand have to be a little more specialised to survive than in mud. Um, but we'll often find animals. They might you might even find a, a pile of their poo on the on the sandy beach um, where they've sort of eaten up some sand and pooed it back out. So uh, 
There's lots of animals that still live in sand. And then, and then I've got, I think we, we talked about the grassy seabed. I didn't know that you could have, I thought grass was just on land, but you can have grassy seabeds too. Is that right? Yeah, there are actually plants that can survive underwater. So seagrasses will grow. And they're really important uh, species because they stabilize those sands by holding it together with their root structures. And then lots more animals can come in and colonize there and they create a really important habitat. And they're important nursery grounds for fish where babies hang out and, uh, and seahorses and things like that. There's some really important ones here in the UK, including the Lime Bay uh, seagrass beds. Amazing. So, so let's dive in. Let's go, go and try and find some of these animals underwater. Uh, if you're watching, you've got a couple of worksheets, student sheets that you can be using to spot and note some of the different animals that we might see in the waters around the UK and specifically those animals that live on the seabed. And we've got an introductory video that shows from the shore the beginnings of the seabed. And that's where most people will encounter it. They won't be going scuba diving or deep sea diving. They'll be, be at the shore. And we'll, we'll show this video. And Adam and Kerry, if you can just tell us a little bit about what we might be seeing. In this first video, we're watching the, the, the tides go in and out, and that's a really important feature of our rocky shores. The animals that live on a rocky shore, they're all marine animals, but they have to be able to cope with the sea going out and being exposed to air. These are animals with gills, so they have to breathe from the water. So they've all got these amazing uh, adaptations to track water around them when the tide goes out so that they can survive these periods of the tide going out. Um, so things like limpets, have really thick shells that they will clamp down onto the rock and trap water within their shells. Um, other animals will hide in nooks and crannies in that beach where the seaweed keeps them moist. So the biggest adaptation to having to live in a rocky shore is being able to stay wet because these are marine animals. Brilliant. So if, if, if I'm standing right on the edge of a beach at low tide or the edge of a shore at low tide, I'm, I'm actually standing on the seabed. Yeah, you are. You're standing on the seabed. And um, as you walk out, you'll, uh, you'll find different adaptations as well, based on how deep the water would be if the tide was in. So uh, on the, on the, close, to the close to the water's edge, you'll find sort of reddy algae. And as you go out, you'll find brown, brown algae. And that's because the light can only penetrate so far through water. So you have this amazing array of different uh, animals, organisms that are supporting each other across the, uh, the rocky shore based on as Kerry said, as the water goes out, they have to be able to survive dry times. But also light uh, has a really important part in creating zones of animals across the uh, rocky shore. Brilliant. Well, let's meet some of these animals. We've talked about a lot about where they live. Let's meet some of them. And, and first up, we've got uh, an animal, a barnacle, which I think if you've ever been to a rocky shore, um, you might have come across these. Tell us about the barnacle. Oh, I love barnacles. What you can see in this video is what barnacles look like when the sea is in. Normally, you will only see them when the tide is out and they have to clamp down their shells to stop that water loss. And so you don't get to see this wonderful feeding behaviour. What they're actually doing is waving their legs in the air. They're waving their legs in the air to capture the food particles in the water. Um, and they've got these really feathery structures that are like a, a comb that capture the particles and then they transfer them to their mouth. Um, they're rather wonderful creatures and they're actually crustaceans, which means they're closely related to crabs, but they look completely different to crabs. Very, very different. Um, and we're, we're going to go sort of like along sort of what you might sort of a rocky shore, I think now, and we're going to see as the water comes in, how, how the behaviour of those different animals starts to change. So, so the clip you can see now has some of those limpets on the rocks. Um, they're not having to clamp down now because the water is in, so you might see them move around. But the species moving around really quickly is a tiny snail called a top shell. And top shells are really cool because they have a really special tongue. It's like a scrapey, scrapey tongue that they scrape their food off the rocks with. And that tongue is actually made of one of the strongest natural materials known to man. Um, so they've got really strong, powerful uh, tongues that are scraping the rocks with as their adaptation for feeding. There's also a few anemones in that clip, which are the red blobs. 
And 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 the, the red blobs do different things depending on whether they're in water or out of water. Absolutely. So the red blobs in this clip are a beetle at an enemy. They can pull their tentacles in, but they um will put the tentacles out to feed when they're submerged. Sometimes that can take a bit of time when the tide comes in. There's other species of an enemy that we've got to show you later, which can't pull their tentacles in. So they always have to be in the water. Brilliant. Thanks so much. And and let let's go deeper still. And and uh, and then here's I think we've got a wonderful clip of of uh, a lobster, something that's a sort of well known um, animal on on the seabed. Um, oh, do they just sort of wander around? Do they how, how are they suited to, to life on the seabed? So yeah. So lobsters are actually nocturnal. So what you're seeing is it's usually out and about at night because it's safer to be out there. Uh, from predators. So they'll come out and about and they'll be scavenging for food. So they'll be looking in all the, the crevices in the rock, searching for food. Um, you might find that, um, yeah, you might find that they are uh, have, carrying egg sacs. So females will carry hundreds of eggs uh, in, in their tail almost. Uh, and they'll hold on to those for up to 12 months. They've got big pincers that they use to tear and to grab. Um, yeah, exactly. And you don't want to get grabbed by one. There's an amazing, uh, there's some amazing sizes of claws that can get up to this big. Um, so they can really be, uh, have, a, have a powerful pince. Um, they also uh, wee through their eyes. So that's a fun fact. <laughs> so lobsters wee through their eyes. I and mean, we've seen this lobster hi hiding away. Is, is, are they sort of vulnerable? They've got a hard shell. So it seems like they could just do whatever they want to do all day, but they're, but they're hiding away. What, what, what eats them? Yeah, so uh, large uh, fish species, large sharks, um, they can come and attack them. Um, they will also uh, have fights with each other. So they're quite territorial. Um, and so, you know, one lobster will have a perfect little hidey spot and another one might decide that it wants its hidey spot, so it will come and fight with it. Um, so they need those hard shells to protect them. Uh, interestingly, they will molt those shells. So when they want to grow, the shell kind of constricts them so what they actually have to do is shuffle out of it, like getting changed, and then they're all soft-bodied for a while. And then they're ven very vulnerable when that happens. And then slowly they'll create a harder, bigger shell. And that even allows them to grow back limbs that have come off in fights or, or whatever. So, so if I were a lobster and I lost my arm, I could grow back another arm? Absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of marine animals that can grow back their arms. Selfish can do it too. Selfish will be amazing. So we're going to go down in the sort of like a sort of grassy sort of so now and um, sort of seaweed around. And, and we've got this amazing, I don't know, it looks like a prehistoric squid type thing. What, what's, what's going on here? So that is a cuttlefish. And cuttlefish are some of my favourite things to find around the UK. Kerry and I have been snorkelling and we found lots of them. They bury down in the sand and you can barely see them except their siphon, which is how they breathe. It's like a straw that sucks in water across their gills. And they use that siphon as well to pump water so they can shoot away really quickly by squirting water through their siphon. They swim normally with a little flappy skirt around their mantle that you can see in these videos. You can see them swimming around and they will boost themselves with that siphon. They also have ink that they can squirt to uh, disguise themselves if something's coming to get them. Uh, they have a really specially adapted eye. They can't see color, um, but they can see polarized light. And so that allows them to uh, change their color and their sort of skin structure to look like the sand or the rock that they're hiding around. They're incredibly uh, well-adapted animals to surviving in the sandy and rocky and seagrassy environments around the UK. They're actually the same group of animals as those limpets, aren't they? They're, they're mollusks. Um, I know they look very, very different to, to limpets, but they're the same group of animals. I mean, they have their shell on the inside, and that's that cuttlefish bone that you sometimes see washed up on the strand line after a storm. That's actually an internal shell for cuttlefish. And you may have seen about octopus, but uh, cuttlefish is uh, uh, similar. They're exceptionally intelligent. Um, they have a very large brain. They can count but they can also remember what, where, and when they last ate, which uh, is amazing. And in a scientific study, they were shown to have 
more restraint when it came to eating food than uh, children. Children <laughs> were given marshmallows and told to wait, and then they would get another one. Lots of children just eat the first marshmallow. But cuttlefish were shown to actually, I'm going to wait for my second shrimp. I'm going to wait and wait and wait. So they're very intelligent. And they can work lots of things out very quickly. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So we talked a, a lot about um, essentially sort of, you know, invertebrates. So we've had mollusks, we have crustaceans, we've had cnidarians, the sort of the, the sea anemone. But we've, we've also got vertebrates, fish um, on the seabed. Uh, and I think we've got, we've got a, a nice fish demonstrating some wonderful behaviour um, here on the seabed. Absolutely. Place are flatfish. Um, so they're pretty cool. They're different to normal fish. You might consider a normal fish having two eyes on the side of its head. Uh, flatfish are born like that. But as they grow they and they migrate down to the sea floor where they're going to spend their adult life, one eye rotates around their head and ends up on the other side. Uh, and so most flatfish are right eye-sided. Uh, so they're actually lying on their sides, swimming around on the seafloor. <laughs> uh, and what they do is they have a big sucky mouth on the bottom of their head. Um, and they sort of suck around in the mud. And they're looking for some of these mollusks that we've uh, talked about. They're looking to eat them. They're sucking around in the mud, trying to find their food. So they're pretty cool. Uh, and they like the, the um, cuttlefish. They can hide in the sand as well. They're pretty good at burrowing down and just staying still and waiting for either predator to go past overhead. And I think few now I can now I can move on. Or they're waiting for prey, and then they can suddenly ambush and get their food. <laughs> Amazing! And I think I think we've got one of your favourites, Kerry, to, to end up in. There's this very sped up um, star of the seabed. Yeah. So this is a type of starfish, a sea star. These are from a group called the echinoderms, and all echinoderms have this symmetry of five body parts. Um, we call it pentaradial, it just means it, it, there's five arms, and they are actually speeding across the seabed with these little tiny tube feet, and we'll be able to show you a close-up of some tube feet from a close relation, the sea urchin that we've got in the lab later. But starfish are very good predators. Um, they're actually very good at catching small prey items, and what they do to eat them is avert their tummy so the tummy comes out of them onto the food. So they digest the food outside of their bodies and then they pull their tummies back inside, which is pretty weird. But pretty weird. Amazing. Thank you so much. I love seeing those uh, animals in their habitat. We've had um, the, uh, what have we got? We've had cuttlefish, we've had lobster, we've had uh, place, sea anemone, sand star, and not to forget the amazing top shell um, as well, the 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 snail with the most amazing tongue in the world, apparently. Really strong tongue. <laughs> really strong tongue. Strongest tongue in the world. Not quite, but who knows. Um, so absolutely fantastic. I hope um, you've managed to, whether you are doing the adaptation sheet, noted down some of those adaptations, or if you're doing um, this, the spotting sheet, you've spotted all of those different creatures uh, on the sea floor. But what we're going to do now is that um, Adam and Kerry um, have some species next to us, and this going to introduce us more closely so we can see up close some of those adaptations. What, so what are we, we going to have, 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 have first? Well, should we do our uh, sea urchins first so I can tell you more mm -hmm. about these little tube feet? Um, so these are sea urchins that you would normally find on the rocky shore. They will be hiding under rocks so you can't always see them but you might just be able to see tiny, tiny little tubes waving gently in the water. We're gonna try and zoom in a little bit, see if you can see these tiny little delicate tube feet. Um, this is actually how sea urchins breathe. So this is one of their physiological adaptations is to have these really fine structures that oxygen can diffuse from the water into the sea urchin through these feet. So sea urchins breathe through their feet. Um, they also have some behavioural adaptations. So this is what a sea urchin looks like when we've taken it out and removed its camouflage. But some sea urchins like to camouflage themselves with whatever things they can find. So here we have some sea urchins buried under some bits of seaweed. And they will actually stick bits of seaweed or bits of shell to their heads. 
um, to try and hide because they're not very fast. They're quite slow movers. And so crabs might want to come and try and catch them. So they're trying to hide this behavioural adaptation of camouflage. Unfortunately, we do sometimes find them with bits of plastic stuck to their head now, but mostly they're using seaweed or shells. Okay, shall we introduce you to a sea anemone next? So let's hopefully not knock the beakers over with all of our cables, but here we go. So this is a uh, snake locks anemone. So this is quite a big anemone. Maybe Adam can put his finger in so you can kind of get a sense of its size. Um, it's a really big anemone. And what it's going to do when Adam pokes his finger is it's going to grab hold of his finger with its tentacles. Um, now, anemones capture pooter. They are animals. I know they kind of look like flowers or plants, but they're actually animals. And they capture their food with these tiny little stinging cells. So they're closely related to um, jellyfish. And they have tiny little cells with basically a harpoon inside it. And that when they sense something near them, they off this harpoon to try and capture their food and I have found anemones on beaches with whole fish dangling out of them so they can actually capture some really big things. Now these stinging cells are not particularly toxic to us but sometimes you can be allergic to them so if you are going rock crawling please don't poke the anemones just in case you are allergic but mostly that toxin is, is too mild for, for us humans to feel it but that's how they're capturing their prey. That toxin basically paralyzes food and that's how they can capture things that are so big. Um, now this species cannot pull those tentacles in. Um, so it has to live lower down the shore where it's always going to be covered by the sea. Some of the enemies like the ones we saw in the video earlier can pull their tentacles in, which makes them more able to cope when the tide goes out. So you'll find those higher up the shore and you'll be able to see more of those when you go rock crawling. So if you see a, a red splodge on a rock, that's probably a beadlet anemone. So they have the same tentacles, but they just they pulled them inside so you can't see them when the tide is out. Um, and then finally, my favourite, this is a beautiful ragworm. Now, this is uh, currently doing a nice excited dance for you all. Um, it's swimming tail first. That's a behavioural adaptation to fall predators because the, the natural sort of fish or bird predator response is to go for the bit it thinks is the head. Um, but that's actually the tail in this one. They swim backwards to fall predators. So that if a fish or a bird bites its tail off, obviously the rest of the worm can swim away. And these are another group of animals that can grow limbs back when they lose them. So polychaete worms, this is a type of polychaete, can regrow its tail. Um, takes a bit of time, but it means that it can survive those kind of predation responses. That's one of its adaptations. But these are worms that live inside the mud. Um, so you wouldn't normally see them if you're work walking on a muddy estuary. You'll just see the, the holes in the top of the sand, which is where they're drawing oxygenated water into their burrows so that they can breathe. And another adaptation, a behavioural adaptation to help bring that oxygen in so that they can breathe, is to basically do this little dance, but inside their muddy tubes, and that draws the water current in that helps them breathe. Do you have any questions about worms, Jamie? I have so many questions about worms. You used this great word, Kerry, uh, polychaete. Um, what, what's that all about? And can we get close enough maybe to see what a polychaete's all about? Yeah, so Adam is now trying to get the camera a bit closer so you can see all of the, the tiny little legs that this worm has. These are uh, structural adaptations to living in mud. They have to be able to bury themselves into the mud. And so they've got these feet that are like paddles and they will paddle down and to, to get themselves into the mud. Um, and what, also, what's the Latin name for those legs? They're called parapodia. Yeah. Um, or, or, you know, the, the little bristles inside those parapodia are called keti. And so that's where the name polychaete comes from. Poly means many. Keti are the tiny little bristles that they have on those structures that help them have some uh, kind of resistance in the mud to enable them to be really effective at burrowing into mud. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely. We've, we've got so many questions for okay. you guys. We've got so many questions. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. I, 
uh, from lobsters wing out of their eyes to the stinging cells on an enemy and bristly legged worms. So let's, we're going to, with, with, there's so many questions, we're going to go, 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 go in order. And we'll, we'll, if we can keep the answer short, because I'd love to get through as many of them as possible. Um, first up, we have from um, St. Ursula's Catholic Primary School, we have, are there any underwater volcanoes near the British coast? So we have underwater volcanoes that are extinct volcanoes. They were volcanoes about 40 million years ago, and now they're extinct volcanoes, which we call sea mounts. Sea mounts are extinct volcanoes that are really important underwater mountains, basically. And we have quite a few of those in that deep part of um, the UK coastal water, uh, waters off Scotland in the Rockall Trench. There is one that is 1.8 kilometres high, which is taller than Ben Nevis. So Britain's tallest mountain is actually an underwater mountain. And they're really important because animals gather around. They kind of collect nutrients and food in the water because the water pushes up against the sides of the mountain. And so you get lots of cool species hanging out around those sea maps. So lots of other great questions from us, but I'm going to give Melbourne School a chance. We're going to go to Homewood House School. Hi, everybody at Homewood House, um, who would like to know two things. Do we have a lot of sharks uh, and wildlife around Britain's coast? And is there any coral? We do have lots of sharks. We actually have over 40 species of shark that come into British waters. About 20 of those are here all year round. And then we have other seasonal visitors. And one of the biggest seasonal visitors are basking sharks, the second biggest fish in the world. Um, and they come in when it's nice and warm and they're really big sharks. But we also have lots of little sharks. You probably won't see them when you go swimming, but you might see their egg cases that wash up on the beach after a storm. They're called mermaid's purses. They're kind of these weird brown little purse structures. And you can actually count those for the shark trust if you ever see them. They do an egg case hunt every year around Easter holidays. And it's really important to learn more about those species. That's a really cool thing you could do. And, and corals. coral, how about coral? Corals. Yes, we also have lots of corals, but it's not the same coral you see on the tropical coral reefs that you might see on the TV. Um, they're mostly soft corals, but they can be very pretty. We have sea fans, which are kind of beautiful pink, soft, wavy structures, or cup corals, which can be bright orange or bright yellow and live on pier legs. But we do also have reef building corals, but they are cold water corals and they occur in those really deep waters. It's called Lophelia and it's not as pretty as tropical colours because it can't see the light. So there's no point in being pretty when you're living in the dark. They, they are white and they're very, very slow growing because they're living in that cold water. But they're still really important because they create habitat for lots of other species the same way that tropical corals. Um, we have a great question from Breadalbane Academy. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, <laughs> there's three things. You can choose one of them or, or whatever you feel like. But, but what is the weirdest, biggest and smallest animal you can find off the coast of the UK? Um, right, I might do the smallest. Do you want to do the weirdest? OK, so there are lots of tiny, tiny marine animals that live in the plankton. Um, these can be the babies of some of the larger animals, or sometimes they are always tiny the whole way through their life. My favourite species that lives in the plankton is called a copepod. Copepods are tiny little crustaceans, so a little bit like shrimp, and they have these big antennae, and they hang out in the water, and then they kind of do this sinking, floating, sinking, floating behaviour. Um, but they're really important food for fish, and they're very cool little animals. I mean, in the in the sea floor, there are so many weird animals. Um, I particularly like. Well, you've already seen my favourite, which is the cuttlefish. Um, but there are plenty of other animals. There are some worms that can have multiple heads. Um, Kerry, I think you have a, a favourite worm, don't you? I, I, there's a worm that lives in Australia. It's not in the UK, but it oh, can yeah. have one head and a hundred bottoms, which is pretty cool. A hundred <laughs> bottoms worm. <laughs> so there are so many crazy things that live on the seafloor, uh, and many that we don't even know about because the seafloor is very hard to uh, to look at. Brilliant. Um, really interesting question now coming, obviously people interested in, in the deep, deep sea, um, but asking about the, the amount of bioluminescent fish um, and whether we have any bioluminescent fish, bioluminescent fish species in the UK. 
that's a very good question. I'm sure we do. So it's normally what we call mesopelagic fish that bioluminesce. So they're the ones that live in those deeper waters. It just means that they're deeper outside of where light penetrates because the reason for having bioluminescence is a way of communicating when you can't see each other when you live in dark waters. Most of our UK waters are the light penetration zones. So there's less bioluminescent species within our, our shelf seas. We call it shelf seas because it kind of drops off the shelf and goes into the deep. Um, but certainly once you get into those deep waters off Scotland, you'll get a whole range of fish that communicate with using those bioluminescence. And like I said, it's a communication tool. Shallow water fish tend to communicate by farting to each other. Um, mm. There you go. But in the deeper waters, it's by flashing lights. And so, so is that anglerfish, dragonfish, those, those types of lanternfish? Yeah, lanternfish is a term that covers a lot of those types. Fish. It's quite a big group of species, um, but we don't know very much about them. We're learning about these fish all the time. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have now from St Bartholomew's Church of England Primary. Um, what is the scariest sea creature that oh, lives on the seabed in the UK or the most dangerous? And how can we keep safe from this terrible monster? Uh, there are no dangerous species, but there's some weird looking ones. So spider crabs look a bit kind of yeah, so spider crabs are weird, um, and you might be a little shocked if you saw some of their aggregations. So spider crabs can come onto the coast of the UK, uh, and they can be in their thousands across the seabed. You can't see the seabed because there are so many spider crabs. They're about sort of this big. Maybe they can get up to about this big. In Japan, they can get huge. But in the UK, they're about this big, uh, and they'll be wandering around. They've got quite small pincers, so it's not like the lobster with the big pincers. Um, but they are crawling all over each other and they can be, in, as I say, in really dense colonies. And the, re the reason they do that is because either to breed, they want to find a mate, so let's all get together, or uh, they are coming to molt. And that's the same in the lobster that I talked about earlier. When you shed your shell, you're suddenly all soft and flabby and actually there's safety in numbers. So if we're all soft, soft and flabby together, we can then all kind of grow our new shell. But they're not dangerous. There was a, a headline in the papers last year that called them toxic. That's not true. They're not toxic at all. They're, they're beautiful, wonderful creatures. And they can... Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've got Lavender Primary um, up next. And, and this is a sort of personal question uh, for, for each of you. What's the most interesting thing that you've personally discovered on the seabed? Oh, interesting. Oh, there's so many interesting... I think one of my favourite is um, the uh, part urchin, which is a sea urchin that actually lives in the sand, and that's really unusual. But what makes it so cool is it kind of has this punk hairdo that it, that it sticks up, um, and its urchin spines are actually shaped like little spades to help it to bury into the sand. And then this is an urchin that doesn't breed through tube feet, like the ones we showed you, because it lives in the sand, so that wouldn't work. So it breeds through its bottom. I quite like uh, seahorses. So they're funny little animals. Um, they kind of look like little dragons and they swim around with these tiny little uh, fins and they live in those seagrasses that we talked about earlier. And uh, one of the interesting things about a seahorse is that the dad does all the baby carrying. Um, so pretty unusual in the animal world. Sits around with his fat tummy, swimming around with his tiny fins, <laughs> looking very funny. And they hold on with their tail to things as well. So they'll grip those uh, bits of seagrass with their tail they'll just hide in the seagrass. Thank you both for that. Um, just a quick sort of wave, wave to New York who are joining us this morning as well. Um, moving on, we've got, we've got Kimberton Park Meadows, um, related really to what we're talking about, but it, it's how many fish are, are killed each year for people to eat and, and, and probably sort of how that relates to, I think we, can, we don't have to talk about it in exact tons, but sort of what does fishing do to our, our marine environment and habitat. Yeah, well, overfishing is, is a problem that's worth thinking about when you're doing your food shopping. You can actually look on the Marine Conservation Society's web pages for an app that helps you uh, work out which species are sustainably caught. So caught with environmental protection in mind versus processes that can be quite destructive for this beautiful seabed that we've been telling you about today. So there's a process called trawling, which basically scrapes heavy metal structures across the seabed. And that can destroy some of those beautiful, delicate sea fans or some of the coral that might live there. Um, and it can take those seabeds years and years and years to recover. 
And this benthic trawling process is happening all over the world. It's very hard to find bits of seabed that haven't been fished this way. So we can all do something about that by thinking about which species that we eat and making sure they're not ones caught by these destructive processes. And like I say, the Marine Conservation has a sustainable food app that can help you work out which are the good ones to buy. And that's really important on, on packaging of fish in the supermarket. I remember I bought a fish meal from, uh, from my local supermarket and on the back, they tell you what species it is, but normally it's only the scientific name. If you Google it, you can find out where it's from. And I found that the fish I was eating had come all the way from Vietnam, which really isn't sustainable from a global travel, moving food around, climate change, burning fuel, that sort of thing, to bring fish all the way that, that distance. So there are fish species that we can eat in the UK sustainably um, that have a real positive uh, benefit on the marine ecosystem and the planet as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, we have the next question is um, from Park Royal Year 3, and that is, uh, do barnacles only have legs and not hands? And that Eva was in person. Oh, that's a really good question. I, I think they have many legs. Um, so instead of having different arms and legs, they just have structures that look like legs. Um, what they do is when they, they have a, a, a baby face that swims around, and then they basically swim to the rock they're going to grow up on. And then they cement their heads to that rock and then just wave their legs in the air. So, yes, I don't think they really have hands. I would call them all legs, but they're specially adapted legs. These things. Thank you. Um, from from St. Columbia's Roman Catholic High School, do we have um, octopus and squid? We've looked at the cuttlefish, but do we have octopus and squid in the UK? Yeah, absolutely. Octopus and squid uh, all over the UK. Um, they uh, they are fished here as well. Uh, cuttle cuttlefish in particular are fished, but ox, octopus and squid are fished as well. The things like calamari, you might see them. They're usually deep fried rings in batter. Um, but yeah, we have we have uh, a number of species across the UK, and they are very similar to that cuttlefish we talked about earlier. Highly intelligent, lots of adaptation. Um, yeah, brilliant species. I love I love octopus and squid. I don't know if you've been to maybe an aquarium, you can see them all over the wall with all of their legs and arms, um, really fascinating animals. We have them here in the UK. Brilliant, and I think we have time just for, for, for two or three more questions. Um, so very quickly, uh, from some Columbus Roman Catholic High School, are there sea snakes um, in Scotland or in the UK? I think all the sea snakes are tropical. in the tropics, and most of them are in around Indonesia, I think. But um, no, there are no sea snakes no. in the UK. If that's something that makes you a bit nervous about going in the sea, you're not going to come across a sea snake in the UK. We do have eels. Yes. <laughs> are kind of snake shaped. Fish, but not reptiles. Yeah. Let them before being scientific. Yeah. They are fish, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, and then we have what is the fastest creature off our shores? It's not Adam in his trunks. Um, it's a, a mako shark is actually our fastest uh, marine species in the UK. It's, it's a, a type of shark that can swim at 45 miles per hour. Um, but we also have more and more bluefin tuna appearing in our coastal waters here in the UK. They're also pretty fast, not quite as fast, but they can swim at 40 miles an hour. So two really fast swimming species of fish. And, and amazing. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, just to, to end on, we've had a number of questions about marine biology, when did it start, how to become one, what do you actually do? Can you just sort of, can we wrap up this lesson of, of, of talking about the seabed to how it's studied and how we can have your jobs? Please. Yeah. Well, I, I, I teach marine biology as a degree programme here at Exeter University. And so as long as you have some good biology A-levels, then you can come and do it as a degree programme. There are quite a few different universities uh, in the UK that do marine biology. Obviously, we'd love you to come and join us at Exeter. Um, and then you get to learn much more about all of the different species, the different habitats, and also how to protect them. And there are now really lots of exciting jobs that you can go to after university to look after the marine environment, because we're realising how important looking after the oceans is for looking after our own health and our own economies. And so there are lots of really cool jobs in marine biology now that didn't necessarily exist a few years ago. Yeah, and I think... For you guys now, I would just encourage you to go rock pooling, put a mask and snorkel on, go and look what's in the, in the water. Um, 
when you start to observe animals, that's really what we do as marine biologists. We observe animals. We look at their behavior and then we work out why maybe that behavior has changed. Um, so that is a really great start. Um, you'll start to ask questions in your own head. You can go home and Google them. Why is that animal look like that? Why did it do that to me? Why did it pinch me? Um, that sort of thing. You can go and work out why. And that's all really what science is, is asking why. Um, so getting in, getting in the water, looking at what is in there um, and getting involved. There's also things like sea search. There's lots of things that you can do to help marine biologists. Sea search is a UK program where you can go snorkeling or diving if you're a diver. And you can look for animals. You can write down what you see and then you can put it in on the Internet. And it helps uh, the Marine Conservation Society, I think, know what animals are where across the UK. So there's loads of ways you can get involved even now and prepare yourself for a career in marine biology in the future. And the egg case hunt that I mentioned earlier is a really simple one. All you have to do for that is to walk along the strand line of the beach and see what you can find and log it on an app. And that really helps us understand sharks' conservation. So it's a really simple thing you can do if you're going to a beach over your recent holidays. Brilliant. And do be safe. Um, do go with an adult um, to explore these amazing environments. They can look calm, but it can change very, very quickly. There's some great rock pooling guides online from the uh, likes of the National Marine Aquarium and other organizations teaching you about tides and how they can affect your safety and other things as well. But just I think we've got one last point, and that's if you want to look at worms, you can also look at earthworms. If you're not near the coast, if you want to look at worm behavior, if you make a worm marine, there's a link to doing that uh, on this lesson. Are earthworms and the ragworm you showed us, Kerry, are they doing similar things? They do a really similar job in the environment. They are doing something called nutrient recycling. So by kind of eating the decaying matter in the soil for an earthworm or the marine mud for a ragworm, they digest that decaying matter, re-release the nutrients, and that helps the next set of primary production occur. So it's a really important nutrient recycling and our earthworms and our ragworms are basically doing exactly the same job at turning over that sediment, resuspending those nutrients and enabling the next production to happen. Amazing. Thank you both so, so much. Thank you so much um, to all the classes uh, watching. Hope you have a wonderful rest of British Science Week 2023. Until the next time, it's goodbye from now and thank you. Bye bye.